when Polly Hammond and I set up Real Business of Wine about 10 days ago, we had all sorts of ideas of the subjects we wanted to cover and the sort of people we wanted to talk to. And one of the things inevitably that came high on the list was wine writing, communication of wine. How is it working? What is being a wine writer in 2020? Do we talk about scores? Do we talk about poetic language? Are we talking about uh, technical information? And how do wine writers survive at a time where newspapers and magazines are having trouble and maybe actually cutting down on the amount of wine writing they can, they're actually including? Anyway, we have three top guests today. We have Elaine Tricken Brown, who has become a very, very successful communicator in the US in a short time, both with her own uh, platforms, but also now as the US correspondent for uh, JancisRobinson.com. Uh, we have uh, Eric Asimov, who is the wine writer for the New York Times, which uh, today must be uh, the top column in the world in terms of influence alongside Jancis Robinson and the Financial Times, I would argue. Um, and we also have Tim Atkin uh, of timatkin.com, master of wine, multi-award winner, who not only has his own work appearing all over the place, but also, like Jancis Robinson, is actually effectively a publisher because he has other people contributing to his website. So I'd love to hear, we're going to hear today from them, and we've got questions of our own, Polly and I, and we've got questions already come through from you, the audience, and we'd like a lot more of them. But I'd like to hand over to Polly to start the ball rolling. Let's get started, shall we? And and we will work on getting everyone else into the room. Yes, Robert? Yes, yeah, so I yeah. texted Eric, just so you guys know, since I'm actually in the States with him, I went ahead and texted him. Um, right. So we'll I'm in touch. With, I'm in touch with him at the moment. But Good. Elaine, how do you, what do you call being a wine writer for you in <clears throat> 2020? Well, I spend as much of my time as possible one-on-one -on -one with producers. Uh, right now, that means over the phone. I'm keeping up with how people are going uh, through phone calls, but um, usually I'm doing pretty intensive in-person um, tastings, vineyard walks, you know, deep dive discussions with producers. And I try to um, continuously enrich my understanding of how things grow and work in the business side, growing side, winemaking side, all of that through those visits. But then, but obviously that's, that's not, there's no income there, right? That's just me and my knowledge. But I try and do that regularly, regardless of an assignment, because I find more interesting stories by going in without expectations. Uh, but then in terms of income, I'll try to turn that into different sorts of articles. As you mentioned, I write for Jancis, um, helped her up, update a pretty big chunk of the World Atlas of Wine that just came out as well. And um, But the truth is, and I, I do a little, little bit of illustration work, um, that takes a lot of time. So I just do it if it's something I really feel like doing, uh, which is only on occasion. But the truth is most of my income comes from speaking engagements. So it's keynote addresses and custom seminars. I'll, I'll make seminars on, on different topics uh, for events. And uh, so my income is largely gone right now. You know? I think that's true of a lot of people. Uh, Tim, how do yeah. you feel? Where are you? Uh, I, I've gone really from being a, a generalist as a wine writer, although I suppose I'm to a degree still a generalist, but I taste wines from lots of places with a newspaper column to being a specialist. So I now specialize in about half a dozen areas around the world and I write reports about those, uh, about those regions. So a bit like Elaine, uh, I do kind of deep dives into places. So the minimum I spend in any place is two and a half weeks in Rioja, but I spend uh, over a month in Burgundy and I spend three weeks in uh, in Chile and Argentina and a month in South Africa. So I'm probably traveling about five months a year to do the research for my reports and I publish them myself and I'm delighted to say that people buy them. Please buy them. Please. Well they're great reports. They are, no they're definitely I can absolutely recommend. Now I'm just talking about this so was, last night we were talking about well Jane Anson uh, had a, a great panel from Bordeaux mm. and Justin Gibbs from Livex um, included the fact that 10 years ago Bordeaux was 90 to 95 percent of fine wine uh, part of the, of the secondary market in fine wine. Mm. Today it's 50%. Um, are you, um, Tim, back to the, uh, do you see a greater interest 
in some of the areas you're talking about today than maybe uh, a decade ago when you were looking at those wines? But massive, massively so. I mean, even, you know, I've been, I just added it up there that I've been writing about wine for 35 years. I remember when I started, Bordeaux was the, pretty much, you know, not the only game in town, but it was, it was, it was Bordeaux, Burgundy, a bit of port, a bit of German wine, maybe a bit of Italian wine, maybe a bit of Spanish wine. And the new world was just kind of beginning. Sorry, Elaine, but it's true, you know, um, despite mm. the judgment of Paris, et cetera, et cetera. I think now people are just, um, you know, used to the fact that fine wine can come from anywhere. Terroir happens anywhere, great wine happens anywhere. I mean, I don't know about you, I can't remember the last time I opened a bottle of Bordeaux. I, I mean, I've been opening bottles of wine every, every night for the last week under the, the hashtag um, lockdown wine, everybody please join in and say what you're drinking. And I've just not felt the temptation to drink Bordeaux. Really. I mean, it, it, uh, Elaine, what are you drinking during lockdown? Well, I'm trying to diversify it as much as possible to, um, you know, Stevie Kim just had her request go out of asking people to use the hashtag drink Italian. So, yeah, good idea. Um, you know, so I did that yesterday, but then I um, was like, well, we need to drink local too. So I had a night of um, drinking California. Um, you know, I keep my champagne in reserve. <laughs> I decided I'll only drink wines I really love and really want to drink, but um, that those are coming from all over the world, to be honest. So uh, Excellent. I just ran out of, yeah. Can I just interrupt you and say, welcome, Eric, and can I apologize to everybody? Because if Eric is late, it is not Eric's fault. It is entirely, <laughs> entirely my fault. I, um, because... I blame it on Google, which told me that 6 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time was 2 p.m. Eastern Time in the U.S. No, it's our fault because we switched from Greenish, Greenish Mean Time to British Summer Time, although it doesn't feel much ah. like summer. So welcome, Eric. Um, Thank you. We have about 40 odd uh, attendees. You know Elaine, I, I know. Do you, have you of met course. Tim? You've met Tim, I think, as well, haven't you? I don't know if we've met Tim, but we've certainly corresponded. Yeah, we, we, we met in, in Oregon. Oregon, nice okay. Yeah. So, Hi, what, good to see you again. So the question that just the other two have been answering, and we're going to be taking questions from the floor, as it were, from the 40 odd attendees, plus some that have been sent in earlier, Eric. But one of the questions is, how has lockdown affected you in terms of your movements and, and what you've been doing in the last few weeks? Well, it's uh, as it sounds, uh, I haven't strayed far from my apartment in, in Manhattan, except for occasional trips to the food market and uh, every every once in a while I go out for some air but I get paranoid very quickly and and head home so yeah. it's it's been difficult you know it, it's um, it's a it's a change I don't see my friends I don't see uh, my family um, I, I exercise on via zoom classes in my apartment uh, don't go out to restaurants. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a crazy change for all of us. Now, one of the things that Tim just was talking about was how over the last decade or so, he has become more uh, specific in the areas that he's been looking at um, than, than he used to be. Um, and also the fact you were talking a little bit about perhaps drinking less Bordeaux than people were. What A, what are you drinking at home these days, Eric? And how, how do you feel about, because obviously you've got a column to write in the, in the Times every week. How much of a generalist do you think, do you think of yourself as being or how, where are your sort of specific areas of, of focus? Do you have some? Um, I'm about as uh, general, general a drinker as is possible. Um, depending on what I'm working on, um, that could possibly dictate what I'm drinking. Um, but otherwise I'm, I'm always exploring. And so that I'm, I'm getting wines from, um, you know, as far afield as I can find them. I don't really specialize in, in any area. As far as what I've been drinking, um, I did a, a column uh, that was posted a few days ago on comfort wines, the wines that, that people are drawn to in, in anxious times that that feel good, that, that provide comfort. And what for me, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. We need, we need to know. What, 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 yes. For me, it's, it's uh, Syrah, specifically yes. Red, the Northern Rhone, 
but um, also uh, Siraz from other areas that that uh, take their cues from the Northern Rhone. So I, I've been drinking a lot of, of Northern Rhone recently, but you know I can't I can't restrict it to that. Last night I had a uh, a white from from Austria. Um, my wife wants to drink bubbles all the time, so we've been opening some some pet nats and cabas and uh, a sparkling vouvray recently. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to drink tonight. Elaine, what, what, what do you think of as comfort wine? This is very nice. Oh, yeah, it does. Yeah. Jetta Detour 2011, Cote de Rhone Reserve. Ah, it's a posh very Cote nice. Rhone, but it's, it's bloody nice. I mean, Gr Grenache would be, would be one of my comfort wines, I think. Mm -hmm. Or something Grenache based. Elaine, Elaine, would you like chip in with some comfort wines? Well, for me, I think, you know, and I, Eric, the article Eric just referenced was very nicely done, by the way, and a nice selection of people too. And one of the things that came up there was that for some people, the comfort wine is a feeling rather than a variety. And so for me, it's um, going to wines I have different comforting associations with rather than just specific varieties um and so i've i've been drinking pretty broadly but they're you know it's a producer i had a great visit with or a wine a dear friend first you know showed me for the first time or or things like that those are a lot of people associated their their comfort wine with people that they who they have very warm feelings to yeah them. yeah producers yeah. that they know or yeah, yeah. like yeah um, I think Malbec is one of my comfort wines. I think I would definitely. I think I wouldn't have said that. I'd, I'd always said Pinot Noir because that's really my my go-to, um, my, my my first love in in red wine. But I'm enjoying Malbec as a as a, uh, and I agree with you, um, Tim, about uh, Grenache. But there's something about Malbec that I find the combination of spice and fruit that, that appeals to me. From a specific place or from just Malbec in general? Not Cahors generally, <laughs> basically. <laughs> I, uh, um, no, obviously uh, Argentina is, is the obvious thing and Tim's yeah. done a lot of work there, but, but I'm finding some interesting wines coming from some other places beginning to come through as well. I, I, I don't know about you guys, I find I'm drinking quite a bit of older wine. I mean, wines that, yeah, that, me too. that, yeah. that mm. are ready to drink. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a fair bit of wine on site and so I'm kind of truffling through my cellar and finding stuff and thinking, oh, I wonder what that show's like. And, you know, to be honest, uh, you know, I open something, if it's no good, I just open something else really. Yeah, um, but yeah. but, it, but I, I, I'm, I'm not thinking too much about the future. I don't think any of us are at the moment. We're kind of in lockdown mode, obviously. And therefore I think we're thinking, well, what do I want to drink tonight? that tastes good. So I, I'm, I'm things like this, you know, uh, it could have been horrible, but it's actually, it's delicious. You'll have to believe me. But it's I've got a question from Tim. Douglas Tri Tripasso. Um, I don't know if Douglas would like to answer this himself. I'm going to give you the chance, Douglas. Um, can you, would you like to ask the question yourself or would you like me to read it out? I can just unmute you. Uh, go ahead and say something. Otherwise I will read it. Um, Okay, I will read it through. Douglas is saying, is Bordeaux so uncool? This is going back to a comment that Tim made earlier. Is Bordeaux so uncool now it's on the verge of becoming cool again? <laughs> to to a, a, a small degree that's beginning to happen, but I think that's um, because at least importers in the US at least are seeking out um, Bordeaux producers who don't really conform to the the uncool paradigm. Um, producers who have uh, made efforts to to farm more conscientiously, um, to make wine that's uh, with with less intervention. Um, and of course, you know, when you really think about it, Bordeaux is one of the the great um, historical centers of, of wine and you can't just you can't just reject it wholesale you have to be thoughtful about it i think I, that's I, a very reasonable point I, well i think the thing about bordeaux is that you know bordeaux is over 100,000 hectares so it's it's nearly the size of chile really um, in terms of vineyard area and it's obviously unfair to dismiss it but i think that a lot of the really interesting stuff is happening away from the limelight 
uh, and I think it's people who are doing really interesting stuff. They're people we've never heard of, but the problem is yeah. that the market focuses on, on what sells. Um, and in the old days, it used to be what made a profit for people. I mean, the profit motive is largely gone now because most of these wines, with the exception of Le Pau or Petrus, if you can get hold of a little bit of it, um, you could probably still make money out of it. But I think the money bit's gone. And I think that's a, that's, that's a good thing in a way, that it's no longer seen as an investment in inverted commas. And, and I wish I had more time to, to investigate what's really going on in Bordeaux. And my good friend and Roberts as well, Jane Anson, is doing a fantastic job. I think Bordeaux is almost a country. And to do it well, you need to live there and you need to, you need to live it. I mean, I, I do a reasonable job on Burgundy spending a month there, but I do a better job if I live there and spend 12 months there. But then I wouldn't make a living as a wine writer. <laughs> so you need to balance these things. But, but I, you know, I mean, I, I think my comment about Bordeaux was slightly flippant. Yeah. I, I don't drink a lot of it myself these days because I, I, I just drink other stuff. But Bordeaux, of course, is, is a reference point and is very important. Do you find, guys, I have, I, I, there's this moment where we've all got lots of bottles in our, in our racks and cellars, and that moment where you go to get a bottle and your hand sort of wanders around, and there are bottles that my hand just doesn't stop on, and it probably should stop on, and what but it doesn't. And, the, and somehow or other, Italy and the Rhone, my hand sort of goes there so much more easily sometimes than, than some of the other places. And Chenin Blanc is one of the ones it doesn't go to as often as I think it probably should. Sarah Abbott's got a question. Sarah Abbott, Master of Wine, and Hello. your colleague, Tim. Hello, Sarah. I'm in bed, sorry. We don't want to know where you are. I am too. <laughs> it's really nice here. It's so comfy. Have you got the plane? <laughs> no, no. You're just in bed. Incredibly well. Yeah, right. <laughs> I must feel guilty about how well I am, um, but also thankful. Um, yeah, so my question is, so your, the topic is how sustainable is wine writing? My question is, is wine writing more sustainable than wine journalism? And do you sort of do you see the sort of distinction? And also, do you feel, um, or do you think, the wine writing community should feel any kind of caution or extra kind of carefulness about covering wine during this time of isolation. I mean, you've seen, have you seen all the food shelves in the supermarkets? You know, I work with, um, I've got a friend, sorry, who works as a, a teacher <clears throat> with statemented kids, and they've had to get all the kids who would normally be under special care in the school and actually chat them about how they're going to cope at home you know kids who are in at home um where there's a lot of heavy drinking going on this kind of thing and i mm -hmm. i think it's a backlash if we don't show some kind of leadership on this because there's a lot of wine chat and wine marketing which is a bit like way get it down you do you feel that sense of um almost ambassadorship for the wine industry um, and do you think that wine does have um, a role in kind of the more mindful way of drinking or is it all just booze? <laughs> Those are two very different questions. Who wants to do the first one? <laughs> Who wants to do the second one? Wine writing versus wine journalism. I don't think there are, I mean, Jim, it's, like a, it's like a Downing Street press conference. Where actually, er questions. Eric, I would love, when I used to write for the, the Sunday Telegraph in the UK, I, I had a column every week. I never got to do wine journalism or not as often as I'd like. And if, if something happened that was newsworthy, they'd very often get a local correspondent to write about it rather than the wine writer. And they often got it wrong, I have to yeah. say. Um, but by the same token, I think that quite a lot of wine writers don't do enough journalism in what they write. There's, there's, there's a little bit too, too little digging going on. How, how do you feel about the, 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 the um, definitions there? Well, it's, it's hard for me to speak about other writers, but uh, obviously working for a, a newspaper, I'm a journalist first. And um, one uh, uh, part of being a journalist is to be at a remove from the industry. So I, I, <clears throat> I kind of uh, shudder at the notion that I would be an ambassador for the wine industry. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, I stand apart from the wine industry and I'm responsible to my, to my readers and to my colleagues and employers, number one, 
Um, number two, I, I'm not quite sure on the difference between wine writing and wine journalism. Um, I think uh, Sarah must have something specific in mind and I, I would love it if she would elaborate. Can I, can I come back now? Is that okay? Yeah. So I think that there are very few real journalists who are able to cover wine. And Eric, you've just summed it up. You have to be at a remove. So you have to have that journalistic um, kind of edge. Um, and I know that, you know, um, uh, Tim, you know, are you what I call a proper journo? So you come into it first as a journalist. But actually, if you think of how many journalists there are who regularly, you know, give a toss about wine or cover wine, there aren't that many. And I think the reason there aren't that many is because it doesn't seem to be <coughs> that sustainable. So then you get more of a, a move to what I would call wine writing and where you have these kind of portfolio careers, <coughs> very good communicators, but they're not, they can never be truly independent because they don't have um, an employer saying, right, right, we want you to go and cover this story and we're sending you there. But the, 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 those, um, those, I mean, Eric may yeah. still be able to do that, but, but yeah. if, if he is, if he, if he is, he's unique uh, in that newspapers, even when I was writing for the Observer and the, you know, for 20 years, would never pay you to go somewhere. I mean, the New York Times may pay you, I don't know, Eric, to go. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I'm not allowed to accept payments from anybody else. So yeah. any place that, that I go to is paid for by the New York Times or, yeah. or by me, yeah. um, which puts I, I me think, in the position that's of unique. having to envy many wine bloggers who've been all yeah. over the world and have never yeah. paid a, a penny. Yeah. And the thing I, I think your position is, is, is unique. You know, and, and, and um, so um, the FT, um, for example, um, if you're a journal on the FT and including in how to spend it, mm. they're actually not allowed to accept press trips unless those press trips are structured in a very particular way. Because if the FT wants you to write about something, and you're on salary, you know, you're their columnist, they pay to send you there. Mm. They don't pay, no, they do, because we've had this. No, we've had this, I've had it with Alice Lassels. Mm. You, know, when, Jan, you know, I run press trips. No, sure, I know you do, but I mean, Jance has just been in Argentina. Did the FT pay for to go to Argentina? I don't think so. I don't, can we move on? I've got some other questions here. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that. I've got some other questions. I've actually got one from Michael Ratcliffe, actually, which came up. Um, which I think is, is a more general question. Michael, are you there? I think you should be on the screen up there now. Hi, hey, Robert. Yeah. Looks like Nicole Rowley. Uh, Mike yeah, we, we, Michael's first and then Nicole's coming on just after, I think. Michael, go ahead. Well, hi, everyone. It's um, a very handsome um, photograph of you, Mike. It, it doesn't move much. Oh, good. <laughs> good. I'm, I'm, also, um, I'm also sitting in bed with a glass of wine, so yeah, rather, rather happy with that. But. Um, just a um, very interesting conversation. Thank you, Tim. You made a comment um, earlier. You referred uh, slightly to the fact that Bordeaux is a reference. Yeah. But um, given your experience in, in Chile, South Africa, and the other countries that you um, go so in depth on, mm -hmm. are, are there any new world reference points that are starting to emerge where Bordeaux is paying attention um, to what's going on in the new world? In, in, with which varieties? Uh, just in general, I mean, if you say that Bordeaux, Bordeaux is a reference, I assume you're talking about Bordeaux blends. Yeah, I, um, I, think, I, well, I, think, I think Old Vine Chenin Blanc from South Africa is a reference, certainly for me. Uh, Chile, I think Chilean Bordeaux blends, uh, Argentinian Malbec, we've talked about. Those are the three New World countries that I know, I know best. And I think all three of those in their way are a reference in the sense that I think a reference needs to be a fairly broad reference. In other words, it's something that has a range of styles um, and that is recognizably from a set of places within that country. And I think that's true of those three um, styles I've mentioned. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Thanks, uh, do you want to ch ch chuck in again on that, um, Eric, as a thought? Um, going back to Sarah's question, do you mean? Well, you could do both, actually, if you like, but uh, quickly before we lose this one, what are the references? I mean, you could say Napa Cabernet is a reference. What, what references do you think have, have joined Bordeaux today as international references, would you say? Well, 
uh, certainly Burgundy, um, yeah. Barolo, um, Sangiovese wines in, from uh, Tuscany. I mean, I, you know, I kind of think of, of, of um, any uh, specific distinctive genre as a, as a reference point. There are so many, um, uh, so many grapes that are grown in multiple places in the world and they all have to refer back to an original. So I, I take that as, as a very broad um, expression. Uh, but when I think of, of Bordeaux as a reference point, it's a, it's a reference point also to how, how wines can age and how wines can evolve and the, the complexity and beauty that they can show. So, you know, it's a, it, it, there are many ways to, to look at that. Thank you for that, Eric. I've got Nicole Rollet, uh, producer of wine in the, the south of France. Nicole, can you hear us? We can't see you. Hello, but lovely there. people. Yes, Hello. how wonderful to, to Hi, know Nicole. and say Welcome. all of you. Uh, uh, an absolute pleasure and, and thank you because uh, we're all looking at uh, what's happening in Bordeaux to figure out what happens to us uh, next. And in these big regions, um, I'm glad to hear that a lot of you appreciate Grenache and Syrah, of course, uh, which leads to the inevitable question of how you're feeling about the future of the Rhone. Uh, do you see some exciting things there? And I'm not talking my own book in any way because I think that we're sort of outliers in a lot of the things that we do, but more generally, do you see some uh, emerging areas? Do you see some trends? Are you uh, feeling that the Rhone is continuing to, to keep and uh, increase your attention uh, relative to other regions? Uh, Elaine. Well, to be honest, um, I mean, I think probably a lot of us that are on the panel today have share a love of northern rhone um but but the northern rhone doesn't have the kind of um producer groups that that venture out into the world together and and make the rest of the world more aware of the northern rhone so um i think there's a lot of you know the southern rhone gets tons of attention all the time it seems the attention for southern rhone seems to never go away I feel like the love for Northern Rhone is always there, but there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of um, moving that conversation forward publicly to the to the same to the same degree. So, uh, who have we got here now? Are you actually Berta? Where where are you? Uh, wait, I'm mute you. Berta, where are you? And I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, you? Hi. Normally, I'm in Paris, but right now I'm with my parents in Hamburg. So uh, I moved to be close to them. Welcome. I, I you have a very good question here. Would you like to go you. ahead and ask it? Yes, I was, I'm, I'm a former wine writer for uh, Beton de Souf Wine Guide, and I know that all the wine guides right now have a really hard time. Um, but my question was, well, the wine guides have um, like the Robert Park one and all the other ones, a broad approach to wine, which means they cover a country entirely. But when you are one person, wine critic, working on your own, um, you can cover only part of a country or only s some regions, which means you have also to focus most of the time on already the well-known regions that are already covered because you need to get the public to be convinced that you're good and that they want to read you and you need to have the recognitions of the wine professionals to recognize you also. So um, I was wondering how are you as, for example, Tim, how are you working with that? Because um, it's difficult to find your way through all that and figure out your own strategy to get into it on your own. And well, I, I, I think I'm, I'm lucky uh, in that I started 35 years ago. So I've got that behind me in a way. I think, I think to start now as a wine journalist would be very difficult. I mean, I, I began on Wine and Spirit magazine where I had a job and then I went on to Wine magazine where Robert was um, and, and so people were paying for me to learn on the job as it were and now uh, it's very hard there are just aren't on you know there are very few jobs on on Wine magazine so it's tough um, I mean I I think the the thing is that the, the difficult thing to, to get right is that with wine writing um, I mean I hope Eric won't mind me saying this but I think that if you're writing a weekly column as I was in those days 
you're something of a windsurfer you know that yeah. you're basically you're looking at trends you're you're it's not i'm not saying you don't know about areas but you, but what you have to do is know a little about a lot yeah. what i've decided to do is to know a lot about a little in other words that the only way i can make a living out of it is to focus very much on a number of areas where i'm regarded as being uh, you know a, an expert or somebody worth listening to and my advice to you would be to find an area that other people are not doing i mean uh, the, the place that strikes me that has not been done particularly well is actually italy I and mean, i don't know if you speak italian um but I, you could learn it i think spain although it has some excellent local journalists i think spain there's an opportunity make yourself an expert in areas where the world is interested but there isn't that much in-depth knowledge about it so i mean it's a question of picking those those areas and you know if you look at somebody like uh, matt matt walls who started off on my site um i kind of recognized him as a good writer and i said you want to write a column for me and he said yes and he said you know i'd really like to make myself an expert in the rhone funnily enough nicole's listening and i said matt go for it so he started doing a, a report for me, which is very good. He's now got the gig on Decanter as their uh, Mr. Roan or, or Roan person. And Matt's done a good job of making himself an expert. He now lives in the Rhone. He's learned French. Uh, yes. And you know, Matt is now one of, you know, he's probably one of two or three leading experts in the world on a region. But before moving on, sorry, interrupt, before moving on to Guy Woodward, he's got a good question on. picking yeah. up. Eric, you also have got a particular interest in natural wines, haven't you? I think, is that, is that a fair I thing do. to say? Yes. Um, yeah, well, I, I think natural wines have been one of the most um, interesting developments over the last 20 years and have, um, uh, it's probably been the strongest influence, one of the strongest influences in the last uh, 10 or 15 years and how we, we think about wine and how um, the wine business has developed. Um, it's going through some um, interesting uh, transformations right now. I, I understand that France or, or in, in a wine body in France has recently issued a definition for natural wine. I have to look a little bit more deeply into that and I plan to over the next uh, week or so. Um, but, you know, I, I counterintuitively, I guess, unlike a lot of other people in this business, I don't think that natural wine needs a definition um, at all. And I don't mind the term natural wine either. Well, Eric, come back on well, Thursday because actually we have got <coughs> Alice Firing and the Frenchman who was the person who, who asked for that uh, doing this session. So same time, we, um, same place, Elaine. Could I point, yeah, could I point out though that bringing up the subject of natural wine gets at another way to answer this question. So Tim, Tim mentioned specializing in a region but it's also possible to specialize in styles of wine or ways of winemaking, you know, so Monty Walden, you know, fully specializes just in organic and biodynamic um, wine growing and winemaking as an example. He's built a whole career just focusing on that. But there's also a matter of, um, you know, your specialization might be your methodology rather than um, just your place or style, you know, so I think part of why I have a career at all is because I don't come from it as a journalist. I come from it as a researcher and um, who, who believes in sharing information. You know, I used to be an academic and I can't help but think that way. And so for me, like thoroughness of knowledge is primarily important, but then also academic thinking is such that once you gain knowledge, you share that knowledge. It does, you know, it doesn't belong to you. It's, it's meant to continuously be shared. And so I think that my, I, my coming at it from an academic mindset makes me unusual in broadly speaking in how I communicate about wine and that's what's opened the door for me. So it's not that you have to specialize in a region. It's, you, you know, what is it that you are thoroughly interested in as both Tim and Eric were getting at, but also, you know, how is it that you come to it that's uniquely yours? What do you have to contribute? Thank you know, I think that. answering all of those. Guy, Guy Woodward, um, who's worked with Decanter and various other places. Guy, you've got a, you're going back to, I think, Sarah Abbott's question in a way. Go ahead. Thank you, Robert. And just, just to start off with, hats off to you for this initiative. Oh, I think it's great. And thanks for the pan to all the panelists for uh, 
giving their time. Um, no, I actually just really wanted to revisit Sarah, the second part of Sarah's question, which I think didn't quite get developed, but for me is a really interesting one. So, you know, at the moment, I think a lot of people are spotting potentially an opportunity for the, the wine trade, the off trade, that is, the retail trade, because people are at home, you know, they need some sort of release, some sort of enjoyment, wine sales are up, that's, that's, um, that's a proven fact. And as wine writers, obviously, we see an opportunity to tap into that and to champion wine and to talk about it and how great we think it is. At the same time, in some quarters, there's a concern that people could overindulge. This is a period in which they're left at home with nothing to do apart from drink. And is that something we should be more cautious of? So I'm just intrigued to know from the panel how we think, how they think we should tread that balance. May I respond, uh, I, to that, Robert? Please, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I've written two columns in the last couple of weeks, one on, on comfort wines, as I mentioned, and another on people who, who have had to isolate themselves alone and should they drink? Because in the U.S. culture, there's a, a bias against drinking alone. And I, I said that that was fine. Of course, with the, the usual cautionaries that um, you, of course, shouldn't drink alone if you have a drinking problem, a, a problem with depression or, or other sorts of uh, medical or, or mental issues. And I think that... Um, both of those columns got a lot of pushback. People said, well, how dare you advocate drinking? Don't you realize what a, a, a danger this poses to society? How, how alcohol abuse kills far more people than, than, than uh, the coronavirus, et cetera. And, you know, I think this is something that, that all wine writers ought to, to keep in mind that, that uh, wine, in addition to, to all the pleasures it's it offers can also be dangerous if it's if it's used consumed thoughtlessly or or by people who shouldn't really um, be drinking it but these are are issues that are true all the time not just now yeah. and i think that um you know we can continue to talk about wine and the issues that that come along with wine, wine in, in its cultural manifestation and in, in its aesthetic manifestation. And, um, you know, I think that uh, people who are going to be anti-wine or anti-alcohol in general are, are always going to attack and finding new reasons to uh, attack here. But I think we just have to be thoughtful in how we discuss wine, as Thank always. You. Quick comment here. Somebody mentioned, somebody mentioned uh, Sasha Holloway mentioned that um, Esther Mobley made a, a, a raised this in the San Francisco Chronicle. I think that it is beginning to get more coverage. I think from from wine writers. Who has just joined the panel? Is that Reka? Reka Harris. Thank you, Guy. By the way. Thank you, Reka. I need to unmute you, Reka Harris, who is has been under house arrest in. The northeast of Italy for longer than most people have been under lockdown. Reka, yes. go ahead. Sorry, I got I got off for a second. Um, is this about my question? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, having been here in six weeks into this uh, quarantine lockdown, whatever you want to call it, um, my attention started to shift towards the future. So how will it look like? What are the things that are going to change? Because it's unquestionable that all, all of our lives uh, are impacted. And also from a business point of view, we're drastically affected by what's going on. So my question to you is, do you see or can you foresee how your writing will change afterwards? Or do you plan to change anything at all after this is, this is gone? Actually, can I just pick up on that to add to Rekha's question, Beat has asked also, do you feel a switch of what readers may expect in terms of information, writing style and coverage? So does that tie into to, uh, what Rekha's just been asking? Anybody? Elaine? Well, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I you know, I, um, I've been really cautious about saying much online at all, because, I mean, I think the other side of 
of this in terms of what's specifically happening now is a lot of, with so much uncertainty, a lot of people kind of panic, grab for answers, and we don't have them, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's important to be thoughtful, not just about questions of moderation, but about like, what are we, what are, where are we actually coming from when we communicate? What are we actually trying to promote? Are we, you know, we don't want to promote false confidence, but I also see people trying to promote themselves or their product. And it's a pretty awkward time to do that too. And so I think we need to be thoughtful on multiple levels in terms of communicating. You know, I, um, I spent a bunch of time last week just trying to contact smaller family owned wineries to find out what they're doing to, um, economically survive and you know I had to come up with scopes so I focused on Oregon and California um, and so I tried to communicate you know what are people doing to try and keep their employees what are people doing to try and you know stay in business it turns out a lot of wineries are here at least are doing everything they can to try and also support hospitality people right because that was the first really swift um, annihilation of of work that came through the United States and that's been really difficult to see. And so I'm trying to communicate, you know, how are, how are people doing this work to keep going and to support each other? And, um, and I'm, I'm being really careful and slow in thinking about what to, you know, what to say. Um, and, and it's on, to be honest, it's, it's been hard to come up with, writing so-called regular, uh, so-called regular articles, you know, um, it's been harder to feel enthused about what would be a normal article in a normal time. Eric, writing a, sorry, can I? No, well, I was uh, going to say, I think that's appropriate. I think yeah, being yeah. slow and thoughtful is appropriate. That's Eric, does that uh, chime with you and the, for the times? Yeah, I, you know, since um, this began, pretty much all of the writing that, that I've done about wine have been in, uh, in relation to how, how coronavirus has changed our lives. And, um, you know, I think uh, Elaine published a very thoughtful article about um, the business in, in California and Oregon. I'm working on a similar story right now. And, um, you know, I agree with her, her cautious approach to making predictions, but I, I do think it's pretty clear that um, in the U.S. at least, the, there will be a, uh, a difficult period uh, related directly to, um, to restaurants and, and whether or not the restaurant industry can recover um, at some point because it's, it's such a, a, um, a major portion of the wine business in the U.S. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really unclear and unsettling right now as, as to what's going to happen. Um, I, think, I think that applies to shipping and importing as well. Yeah. We just yeah. know what's gonna the, the, the question, uh, if I'm right in saying, was how it would change us, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, and change, change what you do, how you talk about it. I mean, I, um, it, I, I think it'll change us as, as people, and that's bound to change the way we write uh, and the way we, we, we interact with other people, but also refocus our lives. I mean, I think in a way, I, it, what it made me think was I wanted to do even less, but better, or yeah. even better, if I may say so. You know, I, I just feel that... I don't know if everybody feels this, but the last 10 years, you just feel as if you're speeding up the whole time and that it's so hard to make a living, especially as a wine writer these days, you want to do more and more and more and more and more and more and more to earn your crust. And maybe we'll get used to living with less and thinking, do you know what? I don't need all of this stuff. But maybe, That's maybe the big a smaller bit of it will actually benefit me and my yeah. readers and the people I write about, but especially me uh, and, and the people I interact with, you know, my friends, my family, you know, um, I, 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 think it, I think that's the thing it will change about us. I mean, how long, depending on how long this goes on for, uh, we could still be in six months time having the same conversation. There's an elephant in the room here, which I'd like to bring in, which is, it ties in a question from Nicole Rowley, whom we heard from earlier, which is, 
how much sustainability is going to be part of what we all look at in the future. But also, we all, as people in this world, we travel or we have been traveling a lot. And I personally have had all sorts of questions to ask myself. And, you know, I drive an electric car and I do all some of those things that are right, but I get on planes and I go to all sorts of places and I think, um, I need to go to these places to see the vineyards, to meet the people and so on. But how sustainable am I being? So where does sustainability fit into your lives, both in terms of the people you're writing about, but also in terms of how we all behave as, as wine writers? Um, Eric, well, the big thing, yeah, anyway. the, the big thing here, it, I, you know, at minimum, I would think the situation the world's in right now drives home how much economics is part of sustainability. And that's the part that almost never gets talked about. It, you know, the environment is absolutely fundamentally part of sustainability, but so are our economic systems and programs, right? And, and we rarely talk about how we take care of our workers, how, how we take care of the health aspect of what we do and how, you know, and hopefully this situation will, will make crucially clear where the where our, our economic systems are broken and how we are failing to take care of the people part of what we do. And that must be addressed if we ever want to address sustainability. Yep. Anyone else? Anyone? I, I, I agree completely. I, I, I really do. I, I think that it's not just, I mean, wine writing is, uh, there's a football manager in, in England called Jürgen Klopp, who's a German who, who manages a, a team called Liverpool, for those of you who don't know. And he, he talked about football and said it was the most important to the least important things in life. And I think that's true of wine. <laughs> it's wine a great line. Yeah. yeah. The least important things like, to us, right? Um, wine is, wine is, is irrelevant in the greater scheme of things. There are people dying, you know, uh, while we're having this conversation, obviously. But I think wine is, is still important, not just to us, but lots of other people because we're having this discussion. But it's, it's, it's part of civilization and history and, and communities. And, and all sorts of things. So I think it's important to sustain what's special about wine. Tim, I think, can I just, there's a lady, there's Irene uh, Graziotto, who's just joining us from Italy, I think, whose question is very yes. tied into how wine is perceived culturally. Irene, go ahead. Hello, Irene. Yes, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, I just have a question related to both Irene Eric uh, article on drinking alone. Yeah. For example, in Italy, we have been on a lockdown for the last four weeks. But and I've been extensively covering and observing what Italians were journalists were talking about, and nobody came up with issues such as moderation, probably because uh, that we don't really have that problem or that perception in Italy. So I was wondering, uh, does anybody as France reactions under the radar about drinking alone or? Because this perception of wine as a danger is very different from, uh, well, traditional drinking countries such as Italy, Spain, France, and let's say the US, the UK, or, uh, well, New Zealand, all the basically Anglo-Saxon uh, culture countries. So that's my question. Yeah, in the US, it's, it's very difficult to think of wine simply as a as a pleasure, um, as, as something with an aesthetic dimension. It's often framed as uh, a, a form of self-medication um, so that if you, are, if you are drinking alone, you are going to be drinking a lot and you are drowning your sorrows and, and uh, overindulging. And, um, you know, it's, it, I, I think there, there has to be a, an understanding that that a glass of wine is a pleasure and it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't translate into drunkenness. And this, you know, this goes back a long way in our history to uh, prohibitionism mm -hmm. and to puritanism. And um, it's, it's so uh, entwined in our culture that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to talk about wine with without any of the uh, political or, or moralistic connotations that it brings. An interesting point, the difference between, Tim, how do you see that in the UK? Um, 
Well, obviously, I, I don't think we have a food culture in the same way that, that, that Italy or Spain or France, where wine and food have grown up together, well, food and wine culture, where the two things have grown up together. However, um, uh, impressive in some ways the UK wine industry is, or the English wine industry and Welsh wine industry. Um, I think we're kind of midway between the two. I think we're, we're comparatively new to wine. I mean, that my, my parents mm -hmm. didn't drink much wine. My grandparents definitely didn't drink wine. So I think that's changed. Um, I've lost, hello, Irenik, are you there? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do hear you. Yeah, no, so, so, you know, I, 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 I'm always struck when I go out for drinks with Italian friends, um, how moderately they drink. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm sitting here with a glass of wine, drinking, drinking a glass of wine. Um, I think I probably drink more than they do. Um, and I, I would imagine it being less of a problem. I mean, I'm not sure yet because we're sort of a week into lockdown here whether that's going to be a problem here. I suspect it may be in some instances. Well, I mean, what I can say is that on uh, off-trade sales have sort of skyrocketed because, uh, of course, you don't go to restaurants, coffees and everything. Mm. But uh, I don't see numbers that will allow me to think that people are over-drinking the whole week. Uh, okay. So I have another question, if I have time, uh, Robert, that's up to you. But my question is, should we consider the fact that alcohol is thought to be a problem, okay, as a way to uh, stopping us from having new consumers? For, because we are always talking about like, how can we approach new consumers like millennials and everything? Is this prohibition, like approach uh, sort of like stopping us from, uh, yes, moving towards new consumers and a new way of consuming alcohol. That's an open question we don't have to answer right now, but I guess we have to consider that for the next step. Thank I you, Elena. If Mike Ratcliffe is still Thank listening, you. But, but I believe it's the case that in South Africa, they've stopped the sale of alcohol. In other words, yeah. the, the South African government felt that that, that, that would be conducive possibly to, who knows, to, to, to social problems, yeah. to violence in the home or whatever. But I, I, I think that's, that's pretty draconian. Um, and, and I don't know if that's happened anywhere else in the world where, where the government has taken the, taken the decision to actually stop the sale of alcohol during a, a lockdown. Like, you, you know, yeah. another piece of this that doesn't get talked about very often, but when we're, you know, the, the truth is people need coping things. Um, and, and the truth is that, yes, alcohol can be a problem if it goes too far. And there's also an important middle ground where a glass of wine is a form of harm reduction, mm. you know, or just, you know, just like if someone used to be hooked on cocaine and they, now they smoke cigarettes, well, cigarettes are better. That's a form of harm reduction. If that's the thing that keeps them off the harder drug, that's good. If a glass, of, you know, and so while the goal might be to be perfect saintly people that need no coping assistance, the reality is we all do need coping in different ways. And if a glass of wine is your form of harm reduction under the strain of being house pound, we need to accept that, that that's just how that works sometimes, you know? So again, that's not me promoting it. I'm just saying there's nuance to this conversation and harm reduction is something that's rarely addressed, but is actually a really important part of thinking through best ways to navigate difficult situations. Thanks, Elaine. I've got a question. I, I, we can't have a set of wine writers without addressing another elephant in the room. Sam, Sam Etheridge has got a question about scores and points. Sam, um, we need to unmute you and go ahead. Sam, are you there? I'll read your question if, uh, Sam, are you there? Uh, one, two, three, Sam. Okay, Sam is asking, um, I personally find scores interesting, but also find some tasting notes are a world away from what my unprofessional palate tastes or experiences. I personally think you can see some critics scoring wines very highly, possibly to please the winery or to make a name for themselves. Some people may have some thoughts on that. Wine, like many things, has a degree of subjectivity. So one person's beauty may not be another's. Uh, subjectivity and scores. Guys, Eric. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm on the record as being uh, anti-scores. Um, I think that it, it, it gives a, uh, many, many false impressions of wine. First, that there are all graded on some universal scale and, and that uh, wines are 
necessarily better or worse than each other. I've, I've always thought that wine ought to be chosen by the occasion and some wines are better for one occasion, other wines are, are better at another time. And it's, it's silly to think of them um, on, on, a, on a scale. I also think that um, it, scoring wines doesn't really help consumers or, or help to educate them. It just makes them dependent on critics Tim, you, you score wines, you, you give ratings in your, in your guides. Um, I disagree fundamentally with that. Uh, I, I think that scores are a way of understanding somebody else's palate, right? Uh, yes, I agree that, that we all have our vision of a world of wine. Um, and I think it's a very useful way of saying, does this person like this wine more than another? I'm going to take Eric's point that this wine is better for this occasion than another, but that's still another way of rating wines. It's you saying, I think this wine is better with thanksgiving dinner than that wine is i mean I, I, and i think as critics what's wrong with saying i i like this i like this more than something else the problem i think is when scores take over and it becomes about the number and not about the work behind it the tasting note the analysis of what's going on in a country that's 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 that forms a bedrock if you like of research i think if you're doing that then it gives your scores i hope a context the final thing about do people inflate scores possibly um but the point is that the ultimate judge of that is the, is the consumer that if the consumer buys the wine and thinks hey this jerk gave us 100 points i wouldn't i wouldn't touch it then it undermines that person's credibility you can't go on inflating scores yeah. ad infinitum without in the end undermining your own credibility so i i think scores you know I, ideally would i rather live in a world without scores maybe you know, is the 100-point scale, which is an American thing, slightly silly, bits of it are. You know, would we be better with a 50-point scale or a 20-point scale or a five-star scale? Maybe. But we are where we are, you know, and the 100-point scale is the international gold standard, if you like. And you work within that. Um, and then, you know, you do, I think you do your best to make, it, to make it work for you in one sense, but also, importantly, to make it work for your readers. Elaine, scores? Well, I think, I, I think the, the messiness comes in with the perception that scores are meant to be absolute. I think Tim's getting at a really important point that Tim, scores are a way of communicating something and it's a particular person communicating something to their readers. So it's, it's a way of communicating a relationship and some se sense of information and distilling that information down into one particular thing that then must be understood in context, context of the writer doing the score, context of the tasty note that goes with the score, all of those things. But the, but the idea that scores are merely subjective, I think is also false. Hmm. You know, wine has created an, a, an intersubjective community. We've, we've created a convention of understanding hmm. how to talk about and communicate about wine and also how to taste wine. And that means it's not purely objective. There's not a truth of the wine itself that makes it 96 points. But, there, but a good taster is informed by a history of tasting experience and a history of tasting community. And that, and that means that they're judging wine through a history of tasting convention that does give their score greater context than just their own preference. And that, I think that's really important to remember too. There's an intersubjective judgment that means you're communicating to a community of people. I have to say, I spent some time in New Jersey liquor stores um, <laughs> earlier this year where there was no chance of anybody in the store being able to give any kind of advice. And I looked at this, these walls of wine and I felt I was confused and I know a bit about wine. And I thought, how can anybody walking into this store with all these different wines with the same grape names and the same regions, how do they find their way to a bottle? Are they going to look at price? They're not going to look at the picture yeah. on the label. Yeah. They're looking at something and they don't necessarily have a copy of a book or anything else. They don't necessarily want to get their phone out and check it. They want something quick and easy. Mm -hmm. And whether we like it or not, um, back in the day, the fact that something was a second growth or a third growth actually was a score. Worked, worked for people. It was a score mm -hmm. and it meant less, I would argue, than a score for a specific uh, vintage today. Uh, the Polly, thing you too, the, yeah, go on. Can Sorry. I just add one more yeah. thing there? The, the thing too is like, I think for an individual person, it goes back to what 
Eric's getting at, right? Like, it, what's the wine you want for this context for this occasion? Absolutely. But the other side of this conversation is someone doing work like Tim, spending three weeks or, or a month in just in Chile and tasting essentially all of the wines released in Chile in that year. That means that he has a depth of tasting knowledge about those six regions he specializes in, right? Chile, South Africa, et cetera. That, you know, like there's a, there's a wealth of insight there, right? And that's part of what t makes your report so great, Tim, is like, okay, there are individual scores for individual mm -hmm. wines, but actually it's this tome of information because you have a level of tasting experience for a place that, is, that truly is rare. And that's, that's what people who are scoring are doing. They're tasting a lot of wine and then delivering information based on where things stand in a particular year and over time as well. And I, I think that that does deserve respect, even if in many cases, individuals just want to know what they want to have that day for the picnic or for the family party or an anniversary or whatever the context is. Polly, you've got a question, I think. Yeah, so I have a marketing question because um, we're about to wrap this up. In an era where we can track uh, all of our visitors' interactions with our brand online, how do the three of you, because you do all publish either you know under your own um, under your own sites or under other sites, how do you balance the need for visitors? Um, uh, your own personal brand growth, subscribers, uh, all the data that we have coming in with your uh, integrity of your writing so that you are not producing clickbait. Um, for me, I, do you know what? I, I haven't looked at Google Analytics in three years. So I, I, I just publish stuff on my stuff I like, uh, my site I like. Um, I, I'm, I'm strategic about it in that sense. I mean, maybe I should be a bit more strategic about it in terms of thinking, hey, how do you build the brand? How do you engage with people? Um, I just publish stuff that I like and, and, and I publish reports about countries that I enjoy going to and I find interesting. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe I should be a little bit more systematic about it. I don't know about, about how the others feel about their brand development. I just don't think about it in that way. I mean, I think there are people who certainly do and maybe they're more successful than we are. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, Tim. I think that uh, I, I look for writing that, that reflects um, uh, the writer's interests. And if, you know, if you are doing a focus group in advance to find out what people want, your, your writing will end up sort of bloodless and, and pandering. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I, I'm privileged to have, uh, you know, as, essentially as my last name, The New York Times. So I don't really think of my personal brand very mm. much. And I honestly have no idea um, who's reading my columns, except in a very general sense. Mm. I know I'm uh, being read by people who are uh, absolute novices about wine, who just want to know what to drink with dinner, to, um, to deeply knowledgeable specialists who know far more than I do about their particular specialty. So I, I, I'm very lucky not to have to really think about that. I mean, you're, you're, very, you're very lucky to have a column where you can still write a column, as it were, because yeah. they've, they've pretty much died in England and around the world. I mean, the Telegraph still does one and Jancis and the FT, but that's kind of it, you know? And, and yeah. I mean, I think what happened is a lot of marketing people looked at wine columns and said they did focus groups, dreaded focus group, and said, who's reading this stuff? And most of them said, it's boring. You know, however interesting we think it is. Uh, and that's why a lot of wine columns just got cold. Also, know? because a lot of economic people looked at it and yeah. said, in the dying newspaper business, let's cut off all cultural coverage yeah. first. Yeah. That's right, you're right. You know, I um, mean, uh, Felicity Carter's just chipped in, um, saying they got cold because people, wine people don't advertise, which I think is a, is a brutal truth as well. Uh, yeah, Elaine, yeah. your thought on this? Yeah. yeah, well, so, I mean, I come from a f funny sort of place in this conversation. And I, I mean, I like that the, you know, the three of us have such very different ways of doing our work and, and different types of experience with it. And also, right, I think um, we just, you know, we have three different approaches. So for, I, you know, so now I write in a more formal way, but I got started, um, you know, writing a wine blog, right? And, and you know, 
luckily got got to transfer into writing for magazines um, from that. But the truth is that early on, you know, I would, I was publishing five days a week. You know, I did that for the first several years, just through my wine blog, publishing five days a week. And if I had a piece that would suddenly went viral and got a lot of attention, it really freaked me out. <laughs> and I would, I would intentionally not do whatever that thing was that got so much attention. I would swing wildly the other way and, and do something completely different. Because for keep doing I, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, the, I mean, some people probably, now it sounds crazy of like, it was like I was undermining my own attention, but I was very aware of, I, I, I had that academic mindset. I wanted to understand how wine business worked, how wine growing worked, how, how wine people worked. I was coming from the place of really thinking as a researcher and an understander. And I, and I, I didn't want to be persuaded by the fact that this piece blew up and everybody wants to hear that you know and so but i also knew like okay if you think this thing works right now and you just keep doing that same thing people are going to get over it and they're going to move on right but i you know so i um i and i also knew i was really green you know i knew that i was sincere in my interests but i was green in my understanding of the wine industry wine is very easy to learn compared to the wine industry learning the wine <laughs> industry is hard and i i I didn't want attention before my time. And so if I had something that really took off, I would, I would uh, kind of quietly step back and say, okay, what else do I want to do right now? That's different. And I would, it's not that I would stop doing the research on whatever the subject that had taken off was. It's that I was like, I have lots of things to write about. I'll write about the other things. Um, I've got a question for everyone. Which I think it's a very good one to wrap because we're slightly over eight minutes past, but I think it's quite a nice one to finish on. Um, who, where are the Tim Atkins and Jansen Robinsons and Eric Asimovs and Arendt and Browns, where are they going to come from? I mean, we, we have influencers, we have bloggers. Where are we going to grow them? Are they growing? Do you see them? Anyone? Uh, no, I'm afraid. <laughs> because uh, unless they have, a, they have a private income, because I just think the the way that we used to get into this, uh, Robert, you started in the same way I did on, on, on Specialist Magazine, they're just not there anymore. I think it's, it's very hard without going down the influencer trail. And I think the influencer trail, if you're taking money from people um, to influence the popularity of their brand, then it's very difficult, going back to Eric's point earlier about, about objectivity, to be objective about wine. I mean, there are shades of objectivity and, and, and subjectivity, we all know that. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's very hard. How are people gonna make living as, <clears throat> as I, I don't know. It, it's a great question. And every now and then I see young writers who have a, uh, a really uh, distinctive voice and in, interesting things to say, but they don't have a way to to sustain yeah. wine writing as a business, and of course that's um, that's that's the question that everybody asks. How are we going to monetize this? Mm -hmm. And um, right now there there are just there just aren't outlets. There are only two newspapers in the U.S. that have uh, full time wine writers on staff, mm -hmm. and that's kind of pathetic. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, Robert, it was kind of you to throw my name into that question, but, but I, 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 in another sense, it's not fair. Like I'm not doing what the, you know, these legends of wine ha have done and are doing. And, and I, I think I come in, I can't, you know, I've only been doing this since 2012 too. Right. And so I am still one of the people that's possibly becoming someone in wine, you know, and, and a voice in wine. And so I think I am an example of what, you know, what does it look like to keep trying to emerge in wine? But I, I have a career because I was willing to work really hard and not make any money. And, and like I said, I was, you know, doing work five days a week. It was unpaid. It was through a blog and it happened to grow into something. But I, that happened because I came with an academic mindset. I was like, oh, I'll just go to grad school again, you know, and you don't make money in grad school. You just pay your rent. So I came at it very much from that mindset. I don't recommend that to anybody. 
you know, I don't recommend that to anybody. But what I do recommend is if you want to write about wine, you've got to figure out what are your other skills. It happens that okay. because I came from academia, I have a lot of experience speaking and creating uh, educational programs, right? And so I create unique seminars and I create unique talks. That means I can go speak at events and have, a, have another access point to income. And like I said, I do some illustration work too. That's actually really hard work. And so I don't do a lot of it, you know, but, but I, you, I think if you want to succeed as a writer today, you have to come up with an answer to that question. What are your other skills? You can't expect to be a writer as your income. It can be an accent to your income. The reason, the reason my approach works is because when I go do intensive wine visits in a region or, or with producers, mm -hmm. I can channel it into any of those three things, right? I can channel the, the research of that, that mm -hmm. trip into writing, speaking, illustration, and mm -hmm. I can figure out what the balance is on those. Um, but, you, but you have to have more than writing to do it now. I, I, I think in the end, you have to be a wine communicator. I slightly hate the term. But I think, and you know, you need to be good at public speaking. I think yeah. you need to be good at education um, because j just just making a living as a wine writer, unless you know you're in a New York Times FT situation, which you know there are two of those in the world, um, it's it's not it's not going to happen. Basically, you know, you you could get a good fee for for speaking in public to a bunch of lawyers or doctors or something for the evening to earn the same amount of money writing journalism would probably take you a month of research and, yeah. and writing yeah. to earn the same amount of money. And, and it's, it's very hard to do that. So I would say to anybody who's watching this who wants things, I want to be a wine writer, I'd say become a wine communicator. Um, I, I, to me, the big, the big area that's, that's underexploited is education. I think the online education, if you get that right in a fun way, most yeah. of the education online is fucking boring, forgive me. And I think if anybody made that fun, and actually introduce people to wine in such a way where they learned about it and thought, hey, this is great. And a bit like this, it's interactive. Um, then I think the, the, the people would pay for that. They wouldn't pay a lot, but if you get a million people paying you know, a pound, that's good money, right? Um, if somebody could take that kind of thing about wine viral, um, then I think there's an opportunity there and it's something that, you know, I'm too old and fat and boring to do it, but somebody else should do it. Young, young and fun, guys. I, I'd like to throw in two possible areas of, of optimism here. I think, A, we have a lot of uh, developing markets. We have uh, China, we have India, we have lots of places, and translation is becoming easier and easier um, by the day. Um, and so I think that that's possibly going to be an area. And secondly, what we're all doing here now um, isn't wine writing, but it's wine communication. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My 15 year old son and my 13 year old daughter don't necessarily, they, they love reading books, but they get a lot of their information uh, mm. from uh, YouTube and various things. Maybe the wine writers of the future or the wine communicators of the future will be doing more of what we're doing, but it won't so. necessarily be a worse thing than, um, than, than possibly what we've been doing in the past. Yeah, it could be much better because it'll reach more people faster and more effectively. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think we are over time. I did have a question from Gary Jenner, but I don't know what it is. So I, I think I'm gonna leave that. Um, if you look at your chat, uh, at the chat box, you r r scroll up there a little bit. And there are a lot of very good comments there to, to, that are worth reading anyway. But there's, um, Polly has mentioned that there is actually, we've got a thing called Joe's Bar and Speakeasy, which is basically a continuation of this which we run for about half an hour or, or so um, on that Zoom address, if you just scroll up. It's about 7.10 on the, the chat. So if you want to hang around and join us for a chat or to carry on the conversation, please do so. But in the meantime, I'd like to say thank you to everybody, for our panelists, for the audience. Please, if you've got nothing um, better, to do. <laughs> better to do, tomorrow um, we're looking at education. Uh, do you do, I mean, Tim has got the, the MW, do you do an MW? Do you do an MBA? Do you, which part of the WSET do you do? And what other forms of education? So we've got um, a number of people there uh, for that. So um, please turn up for that. And then uh, Eric, if you're free on Thursday, and anybody's free on Thursday, um, and I think Alice Firing is in the audience here this evening. Um, Alice is back on Thursday with some other people and we're gonna be talking about natural wine 
in, in the bigger sense. So please come back for that. And thank you all. And then join us, go back. If you want to, another thing we have to do, again, go back onto the site and you can subscribe and we'll tell you what's on next. Anyway, thank you and see you Fantastic. in Joe's bar. Thank you. Thanks so much, Robert. Thank, thank you, Elaine. Nice to see thank all you, of you. See you guys. See you soon. See you soon. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.